Once again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to James Cook University, Singapore. Thank you very much for taking your time out of your busy schedules to join us here tonight. It's a pleasure to have you here for what we're sure is going to be a very exciting and stimulating discussion on the issue of scientific literacy. So just as an introduction, my name's uh, Dr. Jonathan Ramsey. I'm the head of academic group for psychology and education here at JCU Singapore, and also a senior lecturer of psychology. I'm going to be the MC for this evening, in case you hadn't guessed already, and also the moderator for the panel discussion. So I'm kind of double hatting tonight. So the topic for discussion today is on scientific literacy, which I'm going to define for the moment as the ability to understand and critique scientific research and claims regarding scientific evidence. I think you can all agree that these skills are more important than ever um, in today's world of information overload, fake news, and opinions masquerading as facts. We have assembled a distinguished panel of experts representing key stakeholders in the movement to enhance scientific literacy, including the media, regulatory bodies, schools, universities, and other educational institutions. Each, I'm sure, will provide a different and very valuable perspective on what scientific literacy is, why it's important, and what we can do to improve it. So a little bit of a word on the progress uh, process for tonight. Each of our presenters will deliver a short presentation, um, and after which all the presenters will be invited together to take part in a panel discussion. If you would like to ask questions of all of our individual presenters, you are encouraged to do so using the um, platform that we have available, which is called Slido. I don't know whether any of you have used this before. It stops people having to raise their hands to ask questions. It means you can do it in a slightly more informal way. So if you wish to ask questions of any of the speakers or raise questions for the panel discussion, please use the QR code that you can see here or follow the link to access the discussion. You would then just need to input the event code. We won't be answering the questions after each presentation. Instead, we will leave them all until the panel discussion that comes at the end. Just as another quick housekeeping announcement, there will also be another quick feedback presentation after the event comes to a close, and we would very much appreciate your feedback and any information you'd like to provide about the event. So, without further ado, I'd like to bring uh, the ev event to a beginning. Um, I would like to introduce this uh, evening's first speaker, Associate Professor Louise Phillips, um, who is um, a faculty member here at James Cook University, Singapore. Dr. Phillips regularly writes on the subject of literacy education, and for nearly 10 years she has taught literacy education at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. From 2014 to 2017, she was co-editor of Practical Literacy, the Early and Primary Years, uh, an Australian Literacy Edu Educators Association journal. Would you please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Phillips to the stage? Thank you. What is literacy? And there's me doing my curious face <laughs> and attempting to go down the rabbit warren. So literacy is a very complex term today. There are multiple definitions. And so I'm going to give you a bit of a lay of the land of what's been going on. First up, would, how many of you would actually define literacy as reading and writing the written word? Yeah. So fair enough, I would expect that because that's probably a common lit dictionary definition. And the word does come from the Latin word literatus, which actually means to be educated and to know the letters, which in English are the alphabet. So, you know, there's some um, view of literacy, the traditional view is, yeah, knowing that code, the code of the alphabet. Um, but much has happened and things that have changed. Let's um, look at the UNESCO definition of literacy. And they are actually positioning it, it from a functional literacy perspective. So really in terms of literacy's purpose. And in the scholarship of literacy, that traditional view of literacy that I just um, questioned you about is a much more didactic view of literacy where didactic teaching practices would happen. It's about knowing the code, knowing the alphabet, knowing phonics, knowing your grammar. Um, and that very drill-based approach to teaching. 
a functional approach, you know, draws from the systemic functional linguistics and really focuses on the purpose. So you would look very much about the, the genre of the text and your audience. And we've also had, probably around in the 70s, the focus was on this um, authentic approach to literacy um, and re referred to as whole language where literacy was applied in real world you know, encounters. So rather than working on worksheets in school, you would actually say, do a cooking exercise and be working with the real world text, which is the recipe. And then in the 80s and 90s, we um, you know, brought in a critical perspective. So uh, this notion of um, critical literacy, where we um, identify bias and assumptions. So that skill, so that no text is neutral. Um, so UNESCO has picked a functional position. And also what's happened is maybe the last 20 years, um, we've had the invention of the computer. We've had the internet. So the landscape of how we communicate, the tools that we communicate with have changed dramatically as well. Now, I am an early childhood educator, so I think the best way to explain this is with a children's picture book. It's a book by Lane Smith. What do you have here? It's a book. How do you scroll down? I don't. I turn the page. It's a book. Do you blog with it? No, it's a book. Where's your mouse? <laughs> Can you make the characters fight? Nope. Book. Can it text? No. Tweet? No. Wi-Fi? No. Can it do this? Toot! No. It's a book. Look. Ah, not Long John Silver. We're in agreement then. He unsheathed his broad cutlass, laughing a maniacal laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Jim was petrified. The end was upon him. Then in the distance, a ship, a wide smile played across the lad's face. Too many letters. I'll fix it. LJS, R, K, LOL, Jim. <laughs> so, sociologists have coined the term new literacies. So we're kind of in a new space and literacies, so plural. They've defined what was happening in the past, this emphasis on the code um, ha, as an autonomous model. And you know that emphasis as well is seen like across Asia, we've seen many nations invest significantly in national literacy programs for you know, economic prospects, for economic growth, all driven by this thinking of the autonomous model. But sociologists recognise that literacy is a social practice and it's driven by ideologies and culture and context. So all of these shape the literacy practice. So in any different context, the literacy practices are different. And they also recognise that we have agency in this space and that we are engaging with multimodal texts. We've also got the term multiliteracies and this funky group, the New London group, I reckon you've made it somewhere in academia when they do a cartoon caricature of you. So they, um, in the 1996, um, came together, these literacy scholars, and, and coined this term multiliteracies. Multi on two grounds, that we, um, like the new literacies, there's diversity in the socio-cultural context and multi in terms of modality, that we are engaging with texts that are multimodal. So they're not just you know, the written word. We are engaging with visual literacy. Even if you just look at the you know, screen of your smartphone, you have come to know all those visual symbols for the different apps on your computer screen, you've come to know all those symbols. There's the haptic literacy with your, your smartphone as well. You know, one swipe this way does this, one touch, two touches does that. We have spatial literacy, you know. So you, when you walked into this room, you read the room of where to sit. Um, when you are dealing with augmented 
um, reality and um, visual and virtual reality. You know, they're all giving you spatial plus visual um, plus audio. So they're multimodal uh, is the sense of our communication landscape now. And what's key to know in this, um, the new texts that we engage with is that there's four dimensions that they give us. And this is why we shouldn't be teaching the, the old way. We need to recognize that we have agency. So we can create playlists. We can create our own videos. We can create our own YouTube channels. We can, we can create anything. And there's divergence. So there's not one set genre that we're always having to follow. Genres emerging. You know, we're inventing words where you know, there's anything goes. We have such capacity with all these tools. Um, multimodality, as I mentioned, and conceptualization. So we're having to conceptualize text in a very different way as well. They're no longer linear and they, um, we are engaging with audiences. You know, if you're just writing on a piece of paper, you know, that will just be, but now um, we are engaging with audiences anywhere in the world. And so we need to think about our text and, and how we can do that. So they're the dimensions. So given all of that, then what is scientific literacy? So we recognize that there are disciplinary specific literacy. And so for science, there's scientific literacy. And here I've got, um, looked to the OECD's Program for International Student Assessments definition. So that is the assessment that happens for every 15-year-old across most nations that participate. And Singapore was ranked number one in 2015. It happens every three years, so the 2018 results aren't out yet. But what I appreciate in this definition is the um, acknowledgement of being a reflective citizen. What I would also like in there is critically reflective and that this is what's key to be needed in this post-truth era so that you can recognise what's been spoken as you know, belief and emotion um, as different to what's facts. Because, and these are the different codes that you know in scientific literacy, so for example the periodic table, I don't know, I just kind of tried to find a few different you know, key things like the pioneer plaque and, and there's um, Singapore's coastlines rising sea level. So there's different genres and codes that you know. Um, this I thought was really interesting that we need this now to enable us to manage you know, the issues with groundwater, disease control, energy and climate change. And this is what's happening. Certainly it's happening in Australia, the US and, and many nations. And this is what I feel globalization is. <laughs> a, a lasting um, thought to kind of leave you with before we progress on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, for that um, great introduction to the concept of literally and re literacy and really contextualizing what we mean when we talk about scientific literacy specifically. So I'd now like to take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor Lim Tip Meng. Um, Professor Lim is the Chief Executive of the Science Center Singapore and a noted figure in the local education and STEM promotion arena. He's a fellow of the Singapore Institute of Biology and a fellow of the Singapore National Academy of Science. He serves as the pre president of the Singapore Association for the Advancement of Science, president of the National Sing Singapore National Academy of Science, and vice president of the Association of Singapore Attractions. He also serves as the president of the Asia Pacific Network of Science and Technology. Please welcome Professor Lim. Well, good evening, everybody. I am going to come from the Science Center's perspective to talk about uh, all of us actually born a scientist. So in other words, Technically, theoretically, we should all be scient scientifically literate. And I like to take the definition of uh, being scientifically literate means we are able to use science uh, in a very constructive way and to be very effective citizens in wherever we live. So the hypothesis is that we are all born scientists, and I hope that you agree with me. Uh, if you forgot how you were when you were a baby, look at any young kids. 
near you, that they are born with this in thing. It's always inquiring, always investigating, it's always innovating. So all of us are born with that in nature, uh, which I call the in things. And the question is, who killed all this? Right? And uh, some, some, some kids, uh, they, they, the first thing they went to school is to sit down and keep quiet and don't ask too many questions. Okay, right. So uh, I'm going to say that it is in us and therefore we have to continue to uh, nurture that uh, so that everybody grew up with uh, scientific literacy uh, and competence uh, as a useful citizen to be effective in the community. And uh, to do that, we need to engage all the senses, and, uh, and this is something which we do a lot in the Science Centre. We are very hands-on interactive, we engage all the senses plus our heart. And especially in, in the new generation, I think you and I also becoming more of such uh, generation, uh, uh, we name it as epic generation, very experiential, very participatory, very image-driven. And we are connected, we are connected to the social media, we are connected to the, the global news, uh, and, and we are connected just with a tick and a click and the swap of our fingers. And uh, we are also uh, facing a generation of us, regardless of age, in the age of abundance. We, we are not in poverty in general, especially in Singapore, and we are spoiled with options. Uh, so is science an option for us to pursue? Is science something relevant to us? Uh, these are also questions. Uh, and, and when we talk about promoting science and promoting STEM in general, uh, I think the young people ask, what is it all about? We can score very well in teams and all that. We can score very well in our examination. But at the end of the day, why are we learning science? The relevance and meaning. And that's where Science Centre wished to, to bring to our audience. And we are very purpose and mission driven. I shan't read you our vision statement and our mission statement. Uh, these are all in our website. Uh, we are trying to develop scientifically literate citizens uh, to contribute towards our national development. And we started young. We start with uh, young kids. Uh, kids Stop is a children's science center. We believe that every child is born a scientist and we want to create an environment for them to continue with that uh, investigative mindset and, 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 and dream and ask questions and dare to imagine possibilities. And Kids Stop is a children's science center for age eight and below. And uh, we also know that all of us are young at heart, so we create exhibitions that are very engaging. Uh, these two, uh, I purposely picked them up because these two are actually in collaboration with a theme park in Gold Coast. Okay, so one is, is called Into the Human Body. You learn biology by going inside and come out the other end. And the other one is about phobia, it's about psychology. What, what is the what is scientific explanation to all kinds of phobia, like uh, fear of missing out for more? And uh, we also want to uh, raise literacy by letting our people understand what scientists, what the scientist does in the lab. So we, we have this gallery, one of its kind, you can't find this anywhere else in any science center in the world. Uh, you come here and be a scientist for a day, and you go through the scientific method, hypothesis testing, and so on. And uh, we also create competition. I think one way of uh, learning and, and really challenging one another to stretch your ability is through competition. So as I speak now, this week is our national robotic competition. And uh, we also brought in this program to schools. It's called the STEM Applied Learning Program. And we want to bring back the childhood days of how we like to use our hands and our minds and our eyes, our senses to work. And also bringing out the new literacy in, in this era of Industrial 4.0. So we, we, we bring this in, that every, every student in this program must learn electronics uh, and, and learn robotics, learn programming and learn design thinking. And it's very participatory. And the whole idea is to use this kind of technology uh, to understand the complexity in, in, in our surrounding and so hopefully use the know-how to solve problems. And to show that the students are really engaged in this program, i just show you some picture. And uh, we encourage the students to work in teams. It's no more individual. It's, and, and one thing nice about this program is we told MOE, we want them to learn with relevance and meaning with no examinations. So this is a program that with no examinations. And uh, we also believe that to really raise the generation of people who are scientifically literate, we must show that science, STEM, is a very important part in, in, in our economy. So we work with the STEM ecosystem, local and, and, and public and overseas, and private agencies and companies to really let our young people know that without STEM, there's no modern civilization. And, uh, and, and for that, we also create many platforms and, and groups and teams to, to empower our youth. Uh, so really want to bring the youth back to reignite the in thing in them that remember you have that. 
uh, mindset to be a scientist and therefore be scientifically literate. And back to the point about the science literacy, the UNESCO and UNEP's uh, solutioning is we really need scientifically uh, mindset and literacy and know-how, STEM especially, to solve many problems we face now, from natural disaster to climate change to man-made warfare, uh, poverty, water solutions, food security, and so on and so forth. And we believe that we need the power of STEM. And not just STEM alone, we must combine that with uh, social sciences so that STEM is not just a cold solutioning thing, but with empathy, understanding what the human needs are. We need to talk about ethics, talk about moral responsibility, and so on. And it is the duty of the Science Centre to empower the youth. And we always say, may the power of STEM be with you. So with that, I thank you. And uh, I know I rushed through, but I have to rush through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. That was a really, really insightful um, introduction to the Science Centre and the work that's done. And it's a very timely reminder that that natural sense of inquisitiveness is something that we have, we're naturally born with, and that's something that we should try to rekindle. So I would like to um, announce our next speaker now, who should be familiar to many of you in this room already. Um, Dr. Chan Kai Chin is a social psychologist and a faculty member in psychology here at James Cook University, Singapore. His long-standing research interest lies in emotions, where he has most recently been studying the role of emotions in constructing social beliefs. He completed his PhD in the Netherlands and then moved to India to start a psychology department at a liberal arts university, and only recently returned to Singapore, where he now teaches at JCU. And we are, of course, very lucky to have him. Um, Dr. Chen, thank you. thank you. OK, so I'm a psychologist. And I will start with an experiment on you. So let me ask you three questions, OK? So some of my students know this. First question, delinquent teenagers who participate in prison excursions are less likely to commit crimes later on in life. True or false? False, true, false, true. Give me a nod if it's true. OK, next one. The more toys children have, the worse their attention span. False? OK. Colorful, colorful classrooms promote uh, learning, or heavily decorated classrooms promote learning. True, false? Okay. Seems like we have some polarizing responses. Okay. The next three questions. Okay. Again, tell me whether it's true or false. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to try. Cheeto sun insulin nanoparticles lower serum glucose level of diabetic rats. Dominic crabs have one zole and one megalopole stage of larva development. No responses, very quiet. Lignin peroxidase creams produce better skin lightening effect compared to hydroquinone. Now, what am I trying to get at? Right, this is the question that's on your mind. Now, I know what many of you are thinking, right? When you see the three questions here, the last three questions, you're wondering, this is not fair, right? I have no idea what's going on. I'm not trained as a biologist, right? How would I actually know this? But compare your experience to the previous three questions. Why did you feel that you know? The previous three questions I asked you about delinqu delinquents, right? I, I asked you something about toys. I asked you something about, you know, colorful kindergartens. By the way, only the second is true. Right? The others are false. I mean, the other two are false. Now, you have this feeling that you can, you, you know something, right? The fact that you can come up with an answer, whether it's true or false, it doesn't really matter, right? As long as you actually have an answer, means that you are actually imagining some possible outcomes. You know what is it like for delinquents to be visiting jails, right? And then you have somewhat of a hypothesis about what this goes on, what, what this means for future criminality. You know what is it like when children play with toys, and you know what is it like when children learn. You know what is it like for children to be in a cl colorful classrooms, right? So you know all these. You know how to imagine. 
So the first thing I want to illustrate to you: How do people come to believe in scientific facts? Is imaginability. The fact that you can imagine something to be true or false. Right, you come to later believe whether something is true or not, and this turns out to be one important principle, which I will illustrate a little bit further、uh, later on. The second principle, right, through visceral experiences,、uh, some of you might say experiential learning.、Uh, fair enough, right? If I throw something at you and it lands on your head, right, you know that gravity exists. You know that gravity is not a social construct. You know that it's real. It's not magic, right? So that's kind of a visceral experiences at how you learn the construct of gravity, right? This concept, this scientific concept called gravity. Now. Many of us do know how to think critically, right? Maybe some of us exercise this capacity more than others, right? Sometimes we do it more often. Sometimes we don't really do it that much, especially when we are tired. But most of us do have this capacity to think critically. Now, I, recently I was at、uh, Indiana、uh, in this organic、um, supermarket, if you like to call it that way, right? So in this organic store, there is a shelf that sells oxygenated water. Presumably. Oxygenated water helps you to have better skin, right? More youthful skin.、Uh, helps your muscle pump.、Uh, helps your heart pump better, right?、Uh, you know, helps prevent hair loss. Helps this. Helps that. All right. I I don't know what else it helps, right? It seems like to help to, to help so many things. Now, I'm not a biologist, right? And I have, you know, I'm I'm not going to contend on what the effects of oxygen is. But I also know I'm not a fish. There's no way. In my mind, when I looked at that, there is no way my body can absorb the oxy- oxygen through my stomach, right? So it must be some something must be really wrong with this product. I just cannot think that it's true, right? So the the critical mind in myself, right,、uh, me as a psychologist, just think this must be something like you know really off, really pseudoscience. Maybe someone is trying to make money out of it, right? So we do all have this capacity to to think critically about things、uh, around our world. Of course. When we fail to think things about the world, right?、Uh, we turn to experts, right? So,、uh, if Professor Lim tells you something about nanoparticles,、uh, you know, if someone tells you about crabs, right? You should probably believe、uh, him or her if this person is a genuine expert, right? And if Audrey reports about our research, right? You should believe her because you know she's reporting. She's an expert reporting on experts, right? So this is self promotion, okay? <laughs> But. Here's the problem with experts. How do you know whether someone is an expert or not? Because these days we have a lot of people who claim to be experts, right? Namely, your Facebook friends. Now, <laughs> right? So we have people forwarding this message, just that message, and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, one of the biggest challenge in society is really how do we educate a scientific, a, a, a citizen, right, a, a, um, a Singaporeans, to know how to tell. Who is a real expert from who is actually a fake expert, right? So, these are the five ways that we, most of us, come to believe scientific facts as facts: imaginability, visceral experiences, critical thinking, experts, and hopefully, we don't believe in any fake experts. Now, I like to round up my talk with、uh, a quote, presumably by、uh, a very famous astrophysicist. I Don't actually know whether he said this. There's some contention whether he actually said this, right? So his quote is, "I don't want to believe, I want to know." Most of the time, when speakers show you a quote, right, they want you to be inspired and to be motivated.、Uh, I'm going to tell you there's something wrong with this quote. I, saw, I, I think that this quote needs to be modified a little bit. I think what we really need is to modify this quote this way, right? I don't want to believe, I want to trust. There is no way we can know everything. There is no way we can be able to critically evaluate everything. At the end of the day, how do we come to believe something as、uh, a scientific fact as fact? Is we learn to trust. We learn to trust someone who is actually an expert. And I think we need to realize this, right? Which is Social trust, the trust in authorities, the trust in experts, and the ability to tell who is a real expert from a fake expert, is something that we need in this country and in many other countries, right? When it, when it comes to developing scientific literacy, right? So that's all for my that's all for my talk.、Um, thank you.
Thanks, Kai Chin. That was a very, very entertaining presentation. And I really like the fact that you've brought us onto the subject of expertise and trust already. I think this is something that I'd really like to come back to when we get onto the panel discussion later. So uh, without further ado, I'd like now like to move on to our next presenter, uh, Ms. Audrey Tan. Ms. Tan is the environment correspondent with The Straits Times, Singapore's national broadsheet. She's written about regional and international environmental issues from international climate change negotiations at COP24 in Katowice, Poland, to the day zero water crisis in Cape Town, South Africa, and the illegal wildlife trade in Southeast Asia's notorious Golden Triangle. She graduated from the National University of Singapore with a Bachelor's of Social Science, Sociology, and holds a Master's degree in Climate Science and Policy from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. Please welcome Ms. Tan. So today I'm here to offer a bit of a different perspective on science communication, a layman perspective, and you can tell because I'm the only one on this panel without a doctor in front of my name. So uh, just a bit of background, I am an environment and science reporter at The Straits Times, so I hope most of you are familiar with this paper. We are the national newspaper in Singapore and um, yeah, we are distributed on Singapore Airlines and stuff. So just a bit of, back, uh, of background about um, Straits Times coverage on scientific issues. We have two pages of dedicated science pages at the back of the world section every Saturday. And uh, we have about four reporters on this beat, uh, one editor and three beat reporters, including myself. So at ST, the science beat and environment beat comes together, but we also report not just on biodiversity and environmental issues like climate change, uh, which we have done uh, quite extensively, but also on things like engineering, quantum physics, and also health. So you, some of you may be wondering how we differentiate with the health beat which reports on health issues, medical issues related um, to people. So for science, we mainly cover the upstream research, research, so things that have not yet made it to clinical trials, for example, or things that are just um, focused on mouse models. So this is where the science beat comes in. Yep. Uh, we also run a lot of commentaries from scientists in the science pages under, th under this section called Science Talk. It's not a weekly thing, but whenever scientists want to offer their perspective on issues, they can just write in to us and we will uh, give them the space to do that. So, okay, this brings me to like the crux of today's talk. Um, what is the aim as a newspaper when we try to communicate scientific research? Well, at Singapore Press Holdings, um, one of our mission statements is to inform, educate and entertain. But I feel like personally, as a journalist, it's also about you know, making science relatable and understandable for the layman and the public. And what about the importance of it? So for me, there are two main um, issues related to this. The first would be science reporting can help people differentiate between fact-based, like take a fact-based uh, approach to an issue rather than emotional-based one. So in some places around the world, like in the US, for example, things like climate change uh, is hotly debated and kind of controversial. But if you actually look at the science behind it, it's indisputable. So I feel like when you, look, when you use science and facts to report on issues that may be controversial, not in Singapore, but other places in the world, it kind of adds more gravitas to your arguments. Um, whether it's climate change or things like vaccines, it helps to you know, differentiate between when people are arguing uh, based on emotions, for example. Um, in Singapore, one clear example would be animal management. So this is a very controversial issue, um, or whether things like stray dogs should be culled. Chickens, if you remember the controversy from two years ago. Should they be culled? Should wild balls be culled? So things like that, it's emotional, right? Whenever you have things like animals involved. So if you take, look at, take a scientific approach to it, sometimes I feel it helps to kind of balance the outcry. Yeah. And also I feel that it's important for the public to be more educated about science because there's a cascading effect. So don't forget, like, uh, okay, let's say talk about climate change, for instance. People are saying that systems le system level approach to tackling climate change, to tackling the waste issue is required and individual actions are kind of on a small scale. But corporates and governments, who are they catering to? They're catering to constituents and they're catering to customers. And these are all made up of individuals. So if you can get the individuals to buy into the science behind the topic, 
it could make things easier like policy wise from whether from the government or whether from initiatives rolled out by um, corporates. Okay, so how scientists and journalists can work together. I'm not sure how many of you here are scientists, but I don't think that we are that different after all. Scientists like journalists don't like to get scooped. You don't want people to come up with your with a paper before you do, right? And neither do us. Neither do us journalists. So there are three main tips that I have basically for how um, scientists and journalists can work better together. The first one would be for scientists to know who your target audience is. So for at ST, our target audience would be your man in the street, your uncles and aunties sitting at the coffee shop. These people might not have the background in the topic that you are doing your research on, for example, compared to say a trade publication or a uh, or magazine that focuses, that reaches out to the scientific community. So I think this is a very big difference between like um, having scientific research portrayed in Straits Times versus other publications. And the second thing would be knowing who the beat reporters are. So for example, if you are a scientist who studies um, biological research, sometimes you may publish a paper and you're not sure how to pitch it. So if you know the beat reporters, the reporters will have a better idea of what makes the editors tick, of what makes members of the public more interested in the issue that you are writing on. I mean, I think Kai Tin earlier gave some points about how you can get people to believe in scientific fact. Imagination is one of them, which is why biodiversity stories in Singapore usually do quite well, because people can't imagine that we have biodiversity in Singapore. But on top of that, it's also about um, critical thinking and having experts come in. So with the help of a journalist, you can actually pack your research to, let's say, um, an ongoing event. So ba basically, uh, knowing the beat reporter would be able to help you find a ho news hook to talk about your research. And lastly is to be creative, to think out of the box. So as scientists, sometimes I feel that scientists are very insistent about holding on to certain terms and phrases because it has to be accurate. But if you're communicating something to a member of the public who don't, who don't have the experience that you have, then sometimes we should be creative in our ways or compromise. So one recent example I had was asking scientists how I should phrase the word holotype. So holotype is like the first specimen, a, a specimen that is used to describe that species. But if I say describe, I mean, the first indicator that I know that the layman won't understand it is when my copy editor comes back to me and says, what do you mean describe? So like, then I have to try to find other ways of, of talking about it. So eventually, the term that I used in the piece was the first and most important of a specimen of its kind, or something along those lines. I have to go, go back and check. But basically, the in implication for that is that the holotype is a very precious specimen. It's not something that you, you can like, just treat lightly, which is the point of the article. So another thing is for scientists to try, find, try to find new ways of communicating your research. Sometimes some stories are better told over video, over new kinds of new media formats like podcasts, which SC is um, trying out a new environmental series, so, or even in, in the form of infographics. So these are just uh, new ways of communicating that we have of effort, uh, new ways of communicating that we have at our fingertips now that we didn't have before. So yeah. I'll be glad to hear your perspective during the Q&A. Thank you. So again, thank you very much, Ms. Tan. I'd like to introduce our final speaker for this evening, Professor Leo Tan. Professor Tan has a PhD in zoology, marine biology, from the University of Singapore, and an honorary DSC from Loughborough University. He is advisor to the Lee Kong Chan Natural History Museum at NUS, chairman of the Temasek Foundation Innovates, and chairman of the Garden City Fund National Parks Board. His research interests are in the field of marine biology, environmental science, science communication, and science education. Please welcome Professor Tan. Thank you. My apologies. I'm still a dinosaur. As you know, you heard, I come from the Lee Kong Chan Natural History Museum and I'm the oldest dinosaur there. So no slides. I anticipated that I would be the last speaker, so I have the privilege of listening and uh, not having to explain what science literacy is and so forth. And we have heard how important science literacy and communication are in a post-truth world. Much of the global economy, we all know, is dependent on science and technology. But do governments, business, and the public really believe they should comprehend 
and use the knowledge for the benefit of their communities, countries, and society? Or should they do it for their own ends? Education, media, science institutions, and science centers, scientific academies, you have heard, all play a part. But the real question is, if the public, and that includes politicians, everybody, knows more about science and technology, would they know or would they view science and technology as scientists do? We have heard they don't. The biggest challenge, I think, to the public understanding of science lies in the fact that people, and politicians in particular, do not use scientific rationality and facts to make decisions. Rather, like most people, the psychologists will tell you, they rely on cognitive screening mechanisms, such as heuristics, ideology, religion, emotion. You have heard all of this. And there is a deluge of science and technology info out there. But what and who should we believe? Even in the field of environmental conservation and biodiversity where I belong, it isn't the facts that will convince your target audience. It is imperative to engage and talk with influential constituents, people, governments, and even religious groups. Very few people realize if you go to the television coverage in the United States, you know that evangelists are the most popular and the most convincing people of all. And yet, we scientists sometimes don't want to sit in fora with religious people. That's a mistake. E.O. Wilson, who is often described as the father of biodiversity and sociobiology, wrote a book in 2006. It's called The Creation, an appeal to save life on Earth. Now, he's a scientist, but who did he address that book to? He addressed it to the conservative religious people in America. What did he propose? He proposed the historic partnership between scientists and religious leaders to preserve Earth's rapidly vanishing biodiversity. It seems strange that a scientist would choose such a platform, but know your target audience, as you heard from Audrey. And he had been advocating science all his life. He's in his 90s. But in 2006, he realized that if you want the world to come along with you, you've got to talk to the world. And although a world-renowned scientist, he believed always in, talk, in talking in ways meaningful to his audience's lives, not his. And this is what scientists often forget when they try to communicate science to the public. He, like many other effective scientific communicators, understand that people will listen if common values, social purposes, and economic development are espoused because it affects their lives. The public would have not bought the research into stem, research into stem cells if it had been explained in purely scientific jargon and facts. The messaging was through stories addressed to the general public how stem cells increase the potential for new medical therapies and social good. The power of stories and the power of people. And G.K. Chesterton once said, the only two things that can satisfy the soul are a person and a story. And even a story must be about a person. And you must appeal to their emotion as well. Because all this of communicating must be for the human good, 
Otherwise, it is a waste of time. The second challenge is that of mistrust of science arising from misinformation about science or simply downright rejection of scientific evidence. The UN Sustainability Goals, it's been spelled out by almost all the speakers, lay out the issues confronting the sustainability of planet Earth. But when the most powerful nation in the world denies that climate change and global warming are happening and withdraws from the Paris Climate Agreement, on the grounds that climate change is a hoax, what should we do? Of course, we know a primary reason why climate change is denied, because the oil and the gas and the coal lobbies are very powerful in the United States and in Australia. The Great Barrier Reef may lose its United Nations heritage status, not because of climate change and the bleaching of corals, but because they want to site a coal mine, which is still in the court, right on the coast where the Great Barrier Reef is. The anti-nuclear stance of the Asia-Pacific countries, including New Zealand, stem from a mistrust of science, partly because in the 50s and 60s, the nuclear atolls in French Polynesia was the test bed for the atomic bombs, the nuclear bombs. And that mistrust still persists till today in many countries of the Asia Pacific region. And all rises from healthcare concerns. The mistrust is hard to displace. And when religious leaders hold sway over a people like they did up to the 1980s, when Prime Minister Malay of Malaysia, Mahathir Mohamad, first took power, he found that in the east coast of Malaysia, the religious leaders were held sway over the people. And when they tried to introduce, the fisheries department tried to introduce sona acoustics to, for them to locate fish safely because in the past, what they did is you send a diver down and he had to listen out for the fish shoals and he sometimes never surfaced. And so sona would have been the effective, modern scientific way. But the religious felt that they would lose their influence if they allowed science and technology to take over what they felt they could control. And Mahathir put an end to that. And it still continues to today in many parts of the world. And more recently, we heard that measles in the no less the United States, a group of Jewish parents actually denied their children the measles jab on the grounds that it would cause brain damage. It's going back in time, reversing the years of benefit. Yes, there will be deaths, just like in Philippines, the new anti-dengue vaccine from the French company is still banned because about 20 children died. But sometimes you have to weigh, there's always risk in everything when the smallpox vaccine, when penicillin was introduced, it was the same. Many people died even because they were allergic to the vaccine. But in the long run, the majority benefit. Breast milk. People couldn't understand in the 1990s why there were higher rates of cancer and brain damage in young children who were fed breast milk, which is touted as one of the safest. It was found that there was a substance in the flame retardants used in ordinary furniture, cushions, sofas, and so forth, that contained polychlorinated uh, or polybrominated uh, At, at, uh, by, uh, by phenols, which was similar to PCBs, which has been banned. And when Sweden, when Europe heard about it, within five years, even before parliament or the government could enact laws, 
the companies voluntarily stopped producing, putting this cancer-forming substance into their flame retardants. But in America, the politicians did not believe, the authorities did not believe, and it continued to the 2004, when California was the very first state to ban these substances in their flame retardants. So you see, politicians play to public opinion, play to pressure groups, and they don't always rationally use science in their decision making. But of course, there are also nice stories to tell. The, if there are challenges, there are opportunities. And in biodiversity, Raja Ampat is in West Papua. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world today. If you have the opportunity, go visit. Ecotourism is thriving there. It's isolated, very hard to get to, and very expensive. The people there, the villagers there, are fisher folk. They used to dynamite, they used to poison the fish to sell. And when Conservation International, a group of scientists went there, they asked the Indonesian government, the regional government, to give them permission to work with the people in order to stop the dynamiting and the poisoning of the fish. And they converted their livelihoods from fishermen to tourist guides. And they have now a perpetual livelihood that will be ensured, providing, of course, climate change doesn't really change the world. And the third challenge is of misplaced national priorities. All the developing countries, whether in Africa or the Asia Pacific, what is the most important thing? Create edifices, show off how grand you are, palaces, whatever. But they forget it is people and not edifices that build strong nations, strong communities. And this is where the Singapore Science Center is a very good example of how when Singapore in the 1960s was just a third world country, just like any of the developing countries in the world, the government of the day was still struggling five years into independence, 1969, to provide jobs, education, health services for its people. But they did one thing, which no other country in Asia did. They decided that they would start an experiential science center in Singapore. And the question was asked, why do you do such a stupid thing? We need food in our stomachs, not a science center to show what are the new things to come in science and technology. But the government believed that 30 years from then, science and technology would play such an important role in national development that if they do not start preparing the young, and you've heard how well stimulated they are, how well educated they are, we are not going to have a future at all. And this is the challenge and the opportunity for countries that no matter how bad the world is, the future always lies in the young, as Professor Lim has said. The power of STEM to the young, the power of economic growth of any nation, of cultural survival, social survival, lies in the young. And if they start preparing their young through institutions like science centers to stimulate, motivate, enhance creativity, stimulate all the five senses for critical creativity and critical thinking and problem solving, the world will be a better place. So thank you for your kind attention. Okay, in that case, I'm gonna look through the list of questions that we have, um, and I'd like to post uh, the first one that we have to the entire panel to see whether they have any comments on this. So uh, we have been asked by a member of the audience, scientific papers are often hidden behind paywalls and written in a language targeted at fellow experts. What actions can be taken to better communicate it? Would anybody like to take that one first? 
uh, part of the Science Center's mission is to communicate science uh, in a format that people can understand. And the way we do it is to translate the words into object, into phenomena, into hands-on in inquiry that can be relatable and also trigger the imagination, which in a way, uh, taking Kai Chin's, once you can conceptualize it, imagine it, you can probably make a better assessment and understand it. So that's how we do it, and it's part of the uh, art of science communication. I agree that uh, we write for our fellow uh, uh, scientists. Basically, a scientific paper is meant to do that, and it's full of jargon, which only the people in your field can understand. But there is a social responsibility today of scientists to make the general public understand what they are doing, because research today is not cheap. Who's paying for their research? It is the taxpayer. They are entitled to know why they are supporting your research. And this is where the media comes in. As Audrey said, working with journalists, scientists can translate. Journalists will help translate their work in a language that is understandable to the layperson. And I think that's critical today. And Slit Meng has also said, science cannot stand alone. We need sociology. We need the social scientists as well, because our work must benefit or affect society in a beneficial way. Otherwise, what's the point? I think Since I've been arrowed, I'll just chime in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I just came back from my studies in the US, and when I was there, I did come across some papers, um, some journals that make scientists write non-technical abstracts. So those abstracts are actually very useful for people like me in terms of understanding a scientific paper and it directs the line of questioning because the, the abstract kind of forces the scientist to summarize what he or she feels is the most important part of the research. So yeah, there's, there's that for the scientific uh, paper part. But um, as I said in my presentation, knowing our target audience is very important. So um, for the person who asked the question, it depends, are you trying to reach out to the scientific community or are you trying to reach out to the, to the general public? Um, from a journalist perspective, when I, whenever I cover um, a new scientific paper that's been published, I never report everything that has that is in published in the paper. And that's because, firstly, the layman who would probably have no experience in that field would probably not understand everything that you are talking about. So we generally just, as, I, I, as I've spoken to other scientists before, the difference between a scientific paper and a, and, a, and a media article is that your layout is totally upside down. So in a scientific paper, you start out with an introduction and then you go into the methodology and then you put your discussion right at the end. As a journalist, my job is to bring the discussion up to the front. What is the news point? What is its relevance to the layman? Why should the uncle sitting at a coffee shop care about your research? So sometimes that would, invo that would involve things that makes the scientists uncomfortable because I'm forcing them to extrapolate. What does your research on mouse models mean for potential clinical trials? And then that's when we will argue. But in, in the process of arguing with the scientists, they learn how to understand how to communicate better and I learn how to make my reporting more accurate. So don't shy away from quarrelling, I guess. I just wanted to add, and I, so I'm new to Singapore. Do you have the conversation here, that online media? I only um, recently found out what it was, so. So the conversation, um, it started in Australia, but it is in many nations, and it's where journalists work with academics to make, so academics make their, their research accessible. And you're writing it in between 800 and 1,000 words, and you work closely with a journalist to make it in lay language. So this is a really good platform that has you know, sprung up in the last couple of years and is open source as well. Yeah. I think that's really good because that's actually something we're encouraging our students to do now as well. So changes to specific modules we have here. They have to write a scientific report. But they also have to write it in a way that can be understood by the layman as well. So getting those kind of skills in early, I think, is really important. Um, I worked in a developing country, India, for three and a half years. And this is a real challenge and it's a real difficulty. Uh, to the person who asked this question, I really know where you're coming from. Uh, 
if you have worked in a developing country, this is a big, big problem. How do you get students there to access uh, scientific papers? Because they're not cheap, right? Uh, you talk about an institutional subscription, right? That can be a million uh, dollars if you want to subscribe to you know, uh, a, a good number of papers. I think Harvard pays that much. Um, some other universities probably, probably pay a lot more. Uh, all I can say is there are ways to get it if you know how. If you Google hard enough, there are ways by someone in Kazakhstan who developed an algorithm to get it. Uh, that's one way. The second way is, uh, which is the way I've taught my students how to do it, is please, if you want to know a particular article that you cannot find in the university, email the authors. Most authors are very happy to share you know, their work. Um, you know, professors like to talk, right? Researchers like to talk about the research. Uh, very often, they cannot talk to their family about their own <laughs> research. So, you know, they love it when someone talks to them. Uh, so if you have a question about their paper, if you want them to send, send you that paper, please just ask them. They are more than happy to share it with you. Yeah, professors are very lonely people. Nobody ever takes an interest in our research. So you will get like a 2,000 word reply if you ever ask them for their, for their papers. So I guess this brings us on to another point about what we should expect of the general public in terms of, of understanding uh, the way that scientific research is conducted. So Kai Chin, you talked a lot about the, the importance of, of building trust in expertise and things like that. And obviously we don't expect research, um, members of the general public to understand the specifics of methodology in any specific scientific field. And yet the methodology and the analysis is, is what separates the good research from the bad. So. I would like to put it to the panelists. What do you think is the, are the most important things that the members of the public need to appreciate about the way that science is conducted? Um, learn to tolerate uncertainty. That's my best advice because, you know, if you look at, for example, red wine, white wine, all this wine research, right? Does red wine make you healthier? Does red wine make you less healthy? White wine, you know, all these kind of things. Right? Sometimes it seems that scientists are a confused bunch of people who cannot make up their minds. Uh, it's true, right? Because every other month or every other six months, you will find supportive articles and you will find articles that say the contrary. Um, so. If you are not trained in science, I can totally understand that you're confused. Um, but this is the, really the nature of science. Many things in science are probabilistic. If you're looking for a black and white answer, forget it. You're not going to find it in science. You're going to find it somewhere else, right? But most scientists that I know, very credible scientists, they, are, they think of the world in many shades of gray. Well, I would say that uh Scientific research is very evidence-based, and evidence-based is uh, dependent on data collection. And how do how do you get the data is is also under a very controlled and, and man-made environment. It's in the, in the laboratory. It's not something that is happening out there. Uh, so when when a scientist did an experiment, the conditions will will result in certain kind of data. And, and this need to be repeated, need, this need to be validated, and there's probability that it may not happen in another kind of situations. So this is the, the uncertainty, and, and the gray area is always there. And, and there's this thing that we all talk about when we are scientists. The more you know, the more you do not know, because you keep asking the deeper and deeper questions. So to, to expect a scientific paper to, to tell you everything, and that's the truth, and you're going to trust it 100%, is, is a bit too naive to, to accept. Yeah. I think that's a very, very important point. Intolerance of uncertainty is something that we have to deal with, and the fact that people are looking to scientists for cut and dry black and white answers is not necessarily what they're going to get. And I think there's a bit of a, you know, a miscommunication and a bit of an understanding gap there. So I'd like to now address some more questions coming in from the audience. Um, I have a question um, about pushing back against pseudoscience. So how can we push back against pseudoscience that is drip-fed to the public every day in little ways? For example, throat lozenges that cure phlegm and cancer. I've never seen that one, that specific claim myself, but I'm sure that it's out there. Other ones like drinking bleach is good for you and things like that, you actually see these kind of things out there. I'd just like members of the panel to maybe share a little bit on how they think we can, we can push back against that phenomenon. I guess I can start because this falls under ca the category of fake news and I'm in the news business, so. Um, 
At The Straits Times, we recently launched this thing called Fake News Debunked, where we encourage people to send us things that they are not sure whether it's true or not, and then the journalists will do the homework for them to check whether the news is really true or not. But uh, as I've told some of my family members, I think one way to get around it is to yourself not spread stuff that you get over WhatsApp. Like, like I think a lot of these things come over from WhatsApp, like he said, she said, and no experts are quoted or dubious experts are quoted. And how do you know that the experts are quoted? It's like you've never heard of the institution or you can't find them, you can't find the academic profiles online. So I think that's just one way, like cross-check, cross-check your references. Um, yeah, that's what we do in the media. So I guess that's something that you guys can do easily too, especially now with Google. And I was just going to add in about yeah, the importance of critical literacy there so that you know, all of us you know, to engage with that and have those open conversations with you know, everyone in your family, like when you're watching television, you know, critique, you know, well, that can't be you know, true. Da, da. <laughs> and it just reminded me one time I was watching um, and there was an ad about dark circles under your eye, you know, this ointment would remove the dark circles. And I was like, oh, oh maybe I should get that. And my six-year-old just said, <laughs> Listen to yourself. You know, you've been telling us to critique these and things and question these things. So, yes, have the open conversations with, you know, your friends and family because you you will be each other's check and and the importance of teaching that that you know that um yeah to find out, you know, what the biases and the assumptions are in those texts. Yeah. Uh, one one fundamental way of doing science is uh, what we call rejecting the hypothesis. And that requires critical thinking, that requires really in asking the fundamentals of what, why, and how. And that, that's where we should come back to our innate in thing. We're always inquiring. I think we should reignite that. That when we see a, a false claim, or oh, a nano DNA particle can change your, or, or, or even by eating GMO, we become Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. I mean, you have to <laughs> really ask and reject the hypothesis by, by questioning and, and finding evidence. And if we can have that kind of critical mindset and uh, what we call scientific thinking, we, we can at least push that back a bit more. Uh, so as a psychologist, I'm very fascinated by pseudoscience. Some of my students are actually working on this problem. Uh, I can just briefly share with you. The fun one of the fundamental problems that I think is there is people think they know too much. People don't know that they don't know. Now, if you were to design an intervention, what would it look like? Uh, one of the things that we are working on is actually casting self-doubts in people. So most of the time when we think of, you know, whether you know this thing, whether you know what, uh, you know, is climate change, change real or not, does vaccine cause autism, things like that, right? We always think of what we know. What if we turn the question around and we ask, what do you not know about climate change? And what we think, right, my students are working on this, what we think is when you ask people what do you not know about a particular thing, it actually slows them down and they, 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 they ask themselves, yeah, what do I not know about this particular thing? Uh, and when you slow down and realize that there are a lot of things that you don't know about something, right, I think this casting self-doubts uh, really can help you slow down or let, make you less susceptible to pseudoscience. Actually, I have a question. So what happens when pseudoscience is spouted by political figures? So how should people overcome that? Because it is a trusted figure because they are in politics and people know them, but what that's coming out from their mouth may not be entirely scientifically accurate. So for the layman, how do we discern fact from pseudo fact? I think this chimes nicely with, with questions that we've had coming from the floor again about basically how do we tell the experts from the not experts? What are the kind of rules of thumb that we can use here to evaluate somebody's credentials when we don't have the time to go through the specifics of how they conducted their research? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, we mentioned Googling their university. That's a good start, right? But <laughs> I, I, I would say, uh, going back to again to the, the way of evidence-based uh, science, uh, we must ask where is the data coming from? What, how many sets of data has it been repeatedly <coughs> demonstrated as such? Sometimes it depends on one or two hearsay and then people just blow it up as if it's real. 
So I think you've got to always ask the sample size, the statistics and so on. I think that kind of mindset, because probability is always playing in this world and, and therefore you need to have quantitative data. Right? Unfortunately, in this day and age, we also have alternative facts to go with the facts that are being presented as well. So how can we address that issue? Um, Prof. Tan? No, the key is always when you re a, a scientific mind, or everybody should have this kind of critical mind, always be skeptical of everything you hear when you're not sure whether it's true or not. When you're skeptical, that means you will go to more than one source to find out whether it's corroborated or not. Of course, if you talk to all the same group of people who have been on the WhatsApp, you get the same answer. <laughs> the key is to go to different sources. You can start with Google, but there are many authoritative sources. Go straight, uh, email. Nowadays, it's so easy to email the so-called experts or you think you know they are experts. When you hear from different sources and you begin to digest, you can form in your mind, how far should I believe this? Or is this something that I really cannot believe? In your own mind, it will be formed. And that is the most important thing because today, day and age, everything is out there. And you must start. The healthy way to start is being skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical. Because when you're skeptical, you keep on asking. And even when you're convinced you should drink lemon juice every day and you get younger, uh, keep every time you drink, is this really true? <laughs> Because there comes a time when you say, it's not going to help me. It doesn't kill you, right, lemon juice? But it could be something more potent. So always ask around. Thank you very much. I think I'd like to move on to another question we have coming from the floor. I think this one might be quite close to the hearts of a number of the students we have in the room. What is the relationship, uh, sorry, none of the speakers mentioned maths and statistical literacy. Given that this literacy unpins underpins all of science, how do the speakers think that this should be enhanced? You know, when I was in school, I hated mathematics. And I regretted it. Because when I was in graduate school, they made me go through algebra, calculus, and everything, statistics. And I said, but I'm a marine biologist. I don't need this. He says, yes, you do. And I really found out how useful this was. And I'm having the same problem now with my students in the Bachelor of Environmental Science. They all complain that statistics is too difficult, calculus is too difficult for most of them. And I said, sorry, you just have to do it. Not because I'm torturing you, but you'll be surprised where, how useful. And you know, you've always heard this. Mathematics is the mother of all sciences, whether arts or science. Every student, every child, must have a basic understanding of mathematics or at least arithmetic. Why? You don't want to be cheated at the grocer or the coffee shop. It's so fundamental. And yet, it is not because we hate or don't think mathematics is important. Usually, you've always had very bad teachers who made you hate mathematics. And that's a different reason. Mathematics is one of the most beautiful subjects, right? If you have uh, seen the autism uh, lecturer in uh, Beautiful Mind, you will know how mathematics helped heal, help him heal, him heal, heal. And this is the thing that, the things you hate, you think you hate, actually you should pursue even more. Because these are the really building blocks of everything that we do in life. Art, there's proportion, there's you know, shape. So what, where is mathematics not involved in our lives? This is why we never discuss it. It's a given. I, I, I use the term STEM, but I didn't explain. STEM actually stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Maths. And it's actually very, very important. And, and uh, in, in coding, in the mathematics, in computational sciences, in, in a lot of big data, mathematics is important. Um, so pardon me for not talking about maths, but maths is is important. It's the anchor for STEM. S-T-E-M. M stands for mathematics. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to just move on to another question. Maybe I'll address one to Louise. What do you think is the relationship between uh, scientific literacy and the other forms of literacy that you talked about, such as literacy in humanities and social sciences and things like that? Can one enhance the other or vice versa? Well, yeah, I think everything's all entangled, really. You know, we do, and this is the problem with schooling, you know, separating subjects that really we learn um, best in an integrated way and that, you know, we should be working on projects with, you know, so everything is all integrated. So, yes, I certainly see that they rely on each other and, um, but we've just come to, um, yes, yeah, specify because we're so, you know, have been categorised through these disciplines. Um, we do have, yeah, disciplinary literacy now. And so that's what scientific literacy is. But as um, Professor Tan was just saying, you know, it's, it's across, you know, across into the arts. You know, we'd, you'd be, you know, measuring, you know, for creating an art, artwork. Um, you're using spatial literacy, you know, in, in similar or, you know, slightly different ways in each using visual literacy in, in, in slim, similar but slightly nuanced ways in each. So there's nuanced differences, but, you know, there's a lot of common ground. I don't know, does that answer the question? I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Okay, I'd now like to move on to another specific question. Um, I think this one was... Um, kind of addressed towards you, Audrey, so I'll, I will ask you. Um, for scientists who transition to a career in science communication or science environment journalism, because it is a path that gets trodden these days, scientists do overgo over that boundary and then face a new set of challenges, what are some of the common mistakes they made at first? Maybe what are some of the difficulties that you've encountered in terms of communicating science to the public? I think one of the biggest mistakes that I made when I was a younger journalist. So I've been a journalist for six years. So in my initial years, I tend to want to squeeze everything into my story. You know, like pack my article with a lot of information. And I think that's a mistake. Because firstly, you don't get to go into detail about the important areas. And secondly, sometimes when you put too much detail into an article, people lose their attention. I'm, I mean, people think, tend to think that writing long articles is very tough. But actually, the tough thing is writing short articles. Because how do you hold on to someone's attention? How many of you actually read from one article from start to finish? Most of my readers, based on the emails I get and the comments on Facebook, only read the headline. <coughs> and then they will tend to having a look. So like, that is... That is um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, wanting to put too much information into an article. Uh, the second, what, let me think about this. Second challenge faced by scientists who... Okay, so when I was in the US, science communication is very big there. And there are, I've attended multiple conferences where scientists go to try to communicate their research. One thing that I've, I experienced when I was interacting with the scientists there is sometimes scientists are not willing to think about how their science is related to the layman. So some people think, firstly, it's not my job. Yeah, it's not my job to make people think why it's important. But I disagree, as Prof Tan has pointed out, don't forget who is funding your research. Um, some scientists in Singapore, I think they are aware of it. Sometimes they will ask me, oh, can you time the article with this grant application that I'm applying for? <laughs> so I'm doing the communication <laughs> for them. But I mean, that's one reason why communi communication, uh, communicating to the public is important. And to do that, you need to learn how to find the hook. So, okay, that I guess brings me to my third point, which is that sometimes scientists don't want to extrapolate or they feel that um, hooking their research to popular culture or current events is dumbing down their research. So one example would be, last year, I'm not sure if you guys remember, there was this really iconic image of a polar bear on a melting ice sheet. So, um, I mean, to the layman, it was very well received, right? Because it was emblematic of climate change. But among the scientific communities, I think there was some debate going on about whether it's accurate, I mean, whether it's ethical, you know? I mean, there's all these issues to talk about. So I'll give you one personal experience that I, which is actually tied into your previous question about the mathematics part. When I was at one of the science conferences in the US, my partner was this, um, was this girl who was a mathematician. 
So in our conversation, we were supposed to pair up. So I paired up with her. And in that conversation, she was supposed to explain her research to me in two minutes. So it's what the scientific community, what the organizers called an elevator pitch. Try to interest your partner in your research in two minutes. Imagine that your partner is drunk at a bar and you only have two minutes of your attention. And she couldn't. All she, all she was like, oh, you know, my research has nothing to do with the layman because she was a theoretical mathematician. She was explaining her research to me <laughs> in terms of five-dimensional uh, structures with imaginary balls. And uh, after a while, my, <laughs> I, I, my attention span, I just, I, I tried, I, I asked her, oh, is it, you know, if I were to, if you were to continue your research in this field, would it help like in cryptography, you know, like Dan Brown's Angels and Demons, that kind of thing. And she said, oh, no. And then she got like kind of offended because like I tried to link her research to popular culture. But, you know, I'm just trying to say that, you know, if you want to make your research interesting, Maybe you should think about what makes you excited as a scientist. I mean, as a journalist, I'm like a vampire. I feed off your excitement. So, I mean, it's easy. I mean, okay, let's talk. I interview a lot of scientists in the biodiversity field. So, especially like people like Prof Dan. Every time they talk, they're like just brimming with excitement. And it's so easy to feed off their excitement because you can immediately see what they're passionate about, where their interests lie, and what is the importance of their scientific research. So. I'm sure that like, if you are a scientist in the physics and the mathematics, there's also some interesting thing that you can talk about your research. If, if, it's, if it's in mathematics, maybe it's the beauty of like 3.142 or something along those lines. So I mean, if you could just imagine, like, find that hope, what makes you excited, and try to explain that to the public, it might be easier for people like me to help communicate your research. And if you are a scientist looking to transition into communication, then that's a good start. Like, always start your article with why Firstly, what would make people interested? What makes me interested? And secondly, what's the relevance to people? Thank you very much. That was, that was a very, very detailed answer. Three different points and some very good advice for uh, budding science journalists there. Okay, I've got an interesting question now that I want to pose to, to Kai Chin first. This one relates to this idea that as a, as a panel so far, in terms of the presentations we've heard, we've, we've, we've kind of been idealizing science as something that's inherently objective, bias-free, and things like that. But one of the questions that are coming, that's come from the audience is, how do you know that scientists are not pushing their agenda, especially if the funding is given by organizations? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm inclined to say we don't know. <laughs> Embracing uncertainty, very scientific of you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, in, in a way we do science, right? You are supposed to declare, you know, whether you have obtained funding from so-and-so organization. So that helps people, your readers, to take into account whether you could possibly be influenced by, say, the tobacco industry, the oil and petroleum and gas industry, and so on and so forth. So that's what we are supposed to do. Uh, if one doesn't acknowledge these kinds of you know, sources of funding or these kinds of affiliations with certain groups, uh, I'm sad to say there's really nothing, uh, uh, there's nothing we can do. Does anybody want to offer a counterpoint to that? Maybe there is something we can do? The blower comes along. <laughs> That's one way. Mm. A lot of, in fact, a lot of this work can only be revealed if there's a whistleblower, because sometimes you can cover your track so well. And you know, just recently, a professor from a very well-known university resigned because he didn't tell the university he was getting money from Epstein. And the list goes on. And you know, in the past, you always heard, right? Red wine is better than white wine, right? And, uh, or just drink wine is good for you, healthy. But they found out that although the journal was in Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine and so forth, the authors were medical doctors who owned vineyards. So this was the challenge. Is it because, was there real bias? Or is it because the doctors loved wine before scientific reasons? That's why they invested in the vineyards. And it, could, it goes on, even in education. We have cases in Singapore. Staff have been removed because somebody blew the whistle on them. And you know the cloning of the dog in Korea, how that scientist who claimed he had cloned the world's first dog was totally disgraced. Mm. These are the kind of things that goes on. Don't forget, scientists are human beings, subject to temptation, and sometimes power gets into their head too. 
they want to be the first Nobel Prize winner of their country or whatever. And this is the foibles of human nature that we all have to deal with whatever profession we are in. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't declare myself a scientist, so I'm kind of <laughs> sitting a bit of a fringe dweller here. So as a sociologist, we argue that there's, you know, the objective truth is impossible that we always bring our subjective being, our values come into everything. And so, you know, what's important is to declare your positionality. So at the front of the article that you declare, you know, from what position that you're coming from, be it that you, you know, you know, your discipline, be it that you have investments in a vineyard, whatever it might be, that that's really important. So then the reader knows that and carries that through with you as they read the article. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, that's something that I think is sadly lacking in the quantitative social sciences sometimes. Yeah, it goes back. yeah. The, the idea that the research is not ideology free, and, you know, your selection of research topics and things like that, all of these different things can be driven by your own personal views and your own personal agenda. Um, okay, I'd like to move on to another question. I think we've probably got time for about one or two more, I would say, something like that. Um, this is an important one about reach. So uh, one of the members of the audience has asked, how will scientific literacy reach far-flung places or people? So for example, developing areas where populations are big, indigenous peoples, etc. Because we talk about some of these methods of dissemination as they apply to the developed world. But obviously, this is not, these are not problems that affect only the developed world. Do the panelists have any thought on that? Um, for the journalism circles, there's been some controversy about journalists who go to indigenous communities and report on the on issues going on there, and the communities never get around to seeing the article. So personally, I have uh, I have reported from those places before. So I mean, I'm aware of this issue. So on my part, I will always send a copy of my of the article, the newspaper to the communities or to the people who, has, who have linked me up with them. Sometimes they don't speak English, uh, but usually because I mean, I'm mean i there with a fixer, so the fixer will usually help to translate it for them. Uh, I, I mean, this is not just restricted to uh, mainstream media like us, but also for things like uh, movies. Like I think <coughs> this was an issue in like Moana and stuff, but anyway, for scientific articles, I mean, that's what I do. But obviously there's no hard and fast rule, so it really depends on the journalist. But yeah, I guess. Sorry. I'll add a point there. I think um, the genre that's most accessible to everyone is story. And like Professor Tan said, that that's, you know, it, it's a way to communicate, you know, across generations, across, um, you know, disciplines, across cultures. And so, and it is about being you know, an ethical researcher as well. So really, you know, recognizing that you're not coming and taking, but that you know it's a reciprocal arrangement that you have with your community. So I've um, um, done research in indigenous communities as well, and so created um, a film, a composite film, and a, a video night, so the whole community could come together to see the findings of the research. So finding different ways, you know, playing with the you know multi literacies that we have access to. You know, what's that um, text? that the people can engage with. And even with, you know, the, you know, the young children as well, you know, that's videos what they can engage with as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. In, in the Science Centre world, uh, not in Singapore, but in countries like Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and so on, they do bring about uh, science communication and science outreach through mobile vans, through science shows that bring all the way to the far-flung villages. Uh, so that's one way of promoting science and technology, engineering and maths to the community where they are. So there are such efforts now and uh, more and more so the science centres in the world are doing that in big countries. Singapore, we don't have to. I mean, we are so nearby and only one science centre is good enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and on, on that note, I think I may have to bring proceedings to a close. I said there was time for one more question. Unfortunately, I'm being told that there isn't. Um, however, we've, we've discovered today that all academics are glad to take long unsolicited emails about their research. So if you do have any other burning questions, um, feel free to email the panel members, and I'm sure the same thing applies to journalists as well. So 
Anyway, on behalf, uh, personally, on, on behalf of JCU, I would just like to thank our panel members for their contributions. It's very much appreciated. So if, uh, if you join me, please, in giving them one last round of applause. Thank you.